Sir, can you please give me your name and your job title? My name is Daniel Gallen. I am a freelance sports journalist, aka a gun for hire. Uh, we are here to talk about cricket's most frequently topless man, uh, <laughs> Faf Duplessis. Don't worry, we won't go too much on, on to his thing. But what, what, you wrote this piece for, was it the Cricket Monthly, wasn't it, that you wrote it for? That's right. And one of the things I find really interesting, and I don't think I've spent, I, I think maybe I've chatted once or twice to Faf and obviously been to a lot of press conferences where he's quite personable. So probably be me, him, you, and about, you know, for dose or something. So we've had long chats. But the one thing that's always struck me about him is he's got that sort of outwardly masculine South African vibe to him, but he's not really that kind of guy because there's also the, uh, uh, you know, there's the uh, music video side of him when he was in A.B. De Villiers' thing. Um, he's a really interesting character in that he represents a lot of what South Africa is, but maybe more a modern South Africa than maybe the South Africa of 10 years ago. Well, that's exactly right. And that's why I was so eager to write this piece because... Like you say, outwardly, he is the he's the alpha male's alpha male, isn't he? He's got an eight pack. He's absolutely shredded. His his hair is always in place. He's got a jawline that can cut glass. He's he's got a, a wonderful voice. He's got those piercing eyes. The way he bats is is quite assertive. Even when he's defending, he does it with like a real presence. And yet, he, for me, his his greatest contribution to South African cricket is the way he's recalibrated the way that we think about the South African captain. You know, when I was coming up, my first captain was, was Hansi Cronier, and he was South African cricket. You know, he was the man hand-chosen by Nelson Mandela to serve as the midwife between two areas of, of, of the history of the country. Then Sean Pollock got the job, and, and he was seen as too soft, and he was too soft for the job. Then Graham Smith Biff, the big man, came. And then Hashim Amla got the job, and again, he was seen as too soft. Then Abe Davidius came in, and he was too, he was a genius. He, he, he couldn't relate to, to that gritty trench understanding of what it meant to be a captain. And then Fav came along and we thought, okay, well, we've been told that he's a great captain. Therefore he must be a good captain because of what we consider to be a good captain in South Africa. You know, had, he had all these traits. And yet as I got to speak to them and we got to see him interact in press conferences, we saw a much softer side of him. So yeah, he's a, he really is just a fascinating character. It's funny too, because uh, you know, a recent podcast I did was with Mel Farrell about Aaron Finch. And when I talked to people about Aaron Finch as a captain, one of the things that uh, uh, a lot of players mentioned to me was that he knows what it's like to be a fringe player, but he also knows what it's like to be one of the best players in the world. And the ability to sort of transcend those sorts of things. I mean, Faf's career was quite late blooming, realistically, when, when you look at it, wasn't it? I mean, he wasn't... Uh, I remember watching him play for Lancashire and just everyone talking him up. And, and I was looking at this guy going, he's a good fielder, but mm -hmm. his leg spin's rubbish and I've never seen him make a run. You know, mm -hmm. and he basically went from Lancashire to Chennai and then back to South Africa. It's a really interesting tale. Yeah, I, you know, it, it starts even before then, you know, being the best friend and the, and, uh, of Ava de Villiers and, uh, you know, they were tracking together in high school. And in fact, there was a stage where, where Fuff was ahead of him. But after they graduated, Ava de Villiers' career shot for the moon and, and, and Fuff's progressed steadily, you know, with mm. respect, he, he got into the, uh, to the, the, the franchises or the team below the franchise, the, the Northerns, but below, below the Titans in, in South Africa. Um, so he, he was, he was tracking. Okay. But the constant comparison with Abe Davidis meant that Fuff Duplessis had to learn to be comfortable with vulnerability to, to be, to be comfortable with insecurity. And I think it was, he, you know, Growing up in the shadow of a genius, of such a giant like that, you know, you, you'd either fade away or you'd learn to to thrive. And I think the lessons that that Fuff learned in those early years definitely helped him when he became captain. He could relate to players who were going through their own personal struggles, and he could shepherd a team that was, frankly, maybe the weakest in South Africa's modern history. So, yeah, those early lessons have definitely uh, uh, stood out for him. Just one other thing that I want to mention, because you really mentioned Hansi Cronier. I remember in, was it 2013, 2014, when Graham Smith was retiring, I wrote a piece saying that it was incredible that people still believed Hansi Cronier was a better captain than, than Graham Smith. And I didn't realise I tapped into an open wound on uh, African versus white English uh, cricket culture, because I suppose, you know, being an Australian, uh, you know, it, there's white players and then there's what you referred to as colored players, and then there's black African players. I can kind of get my head around that, but I hadn't also put in the fact that there are different kinds of white players and that there's this big thing. Was, is, you know, Faf being a captain and being so successful at it, does, is that a big a point of pride for the Africana community? 
I think so. I think I think it's less important now in cricket. When when Hansi was captain, you know, obviously before him was Kepler Vessels and, and, and Kepler and guys like Alan Donald, they started their careers in a time when an Afrikaans player in the team was a very rare thing. You know, it, it, cricket was was the sport for the English speakers and rugby was the sport for the Afrikaans speakers. Um and and obviously the, the, this created this 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 tension and friction and you know Anglo Boer War and you know you, you pull a thread long enough you get to some human atrocity in, in the past, um, but I I think it mattered less uh, you know, but but probably still mattered for some people. I mean Graham Graham was just this this titan. He 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 kind of loomed large over over the entire industry. That he I think he he, he in a way transcended identity politics. Although. I'm sure the comment sections of, on that piece would 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 differ with that statement. I I, I think Faf did embody a particular type of, of of Afrikaans masculinity, but like you said, he he, he had that softness about him, um, which which sort of hazed the edges of his identity, which which made him relatable to people of all cultures. The other big thing you hear about him is what I, I suppose it, it, it became a. a a leadership thing, but I think it goes back further than that. Was you talk about you, you talk to people at his school, and he would stand up for people, uh, you know, the players in his school at, to the coaches. And he went to a, you know a, a very good school. Obviously, AB Davies was there. There were other very good um, athletes as well as cricketers that went there. The fact that from a very young age he he was the sort of person who would stand up for you know fellow players, fellow kids, whatever, certainly seems to have been something that um, you know. It's quite clear now that that is a big part of his identity. I, 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 he, he never quite said it. I, I asked him if he ever felt a sense of destiny that that being captain of the Proteus was something that he was made to do. And you know, he's media trained, and he and, and he knows better than to say yes. I, I feel like that was my birthright. But I do get the sense that leadership was something that Fuff believes he was born with. And, and we can have the debate: to, are, are, are leaders born or are they made? But I think Fuff believed. That he was born with leadership, that, that it was his responsibility to stand up for people, that it was his duty to lean in to conversations, to stick up for his mates. We saw that in the, in the stairwell of, of Kingsmead when he when he stood up for Quinton de Kock, even though one could argue that maybe Quinton had it coming. We don't know what he said to Warner. You know, it's, hard, it, it's a bit more nuanced than that, but but leaned into that, uh, leaned into that into that situation, and I think that 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 anecdote that you referenced about how he stood up to to his coach and, and to teachers. I think even from a young age, he felt that if anyone's going to do it, it should be me because I'm equipped to do it and because I'm born to do it. And it's almost like he had to, his cricket abilities had to catch up with that leadership, with that leadership traits that he had. Because one thing I noticed, so I, I think you might remember, I wrote a piece when I came to South Africa, whenever it was before the COVID um, or du mm. during the start of the COVID, we didn't know it was COVID. But uh, mm. when, when I was out there and I talked to a bunch of South African spinners, you know, um, mm -hmm. most of the test spinners, but, you know, also some uh, coaches of spinners. And every time you talk to someone who'd been through the international team, the way that they talked about FAF was so, I talked to a lot of cricketers and they, Quite often they talk up their, you know, the big players on their team and the captains, but they all kind of said the exact same thing, which was that mm. Faf went off to uh, to Chennai, spent a lot of time with Emma Stoney, and then came back with a completely different theory about spin bowling and how to deal with it. But it was really the empathy that he came back with. And I know that, you know, Imran Tahir will forever, you know, be a failure in test cricket. But if you look at the way that Graham Smith sort of captained him, he captained him in a way that a traditional South African captain would handle a spinner. And, and Faf just obviously saw that from, you know, up close and maybe, uh, you know, worked it out and then working with MS Tony. But there was a real understanding of what a spinner, especially a South African spinner, needed um, that, that he was willing to give it. It's a really, it was so universal. Everyone I talked to mentioned it. Mm -hmm. it, it it's true. You know, I, I, I was really conscious that the first draft that I, that I put together, it, it read like a complete hagiography because no one had a bad word to say about this guy and empathy is such an important thing. And I think that empathy comes from, you know, growing up in the, in, in the shadow of Abe de Villiers and, and having to, having to go the, to, to Lancashire and not do very well, having to go to Chennai and learn from, from guys like Emma Stoney. It didn't, it didn't make the cut, but, um, you know, Fuff spoke glowingly on, 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 of Stephen Fleming and, and it, what did make the cut was Brendan McCullum. So he really saw leadership, as something that was part of his game. I think a lot of captains think that, okay, well, if, if I put in, if I put up the runs, 
if I speak in a deep voice, if I, if I, if I confront yeah. the press with my chest out, well, then I'm being a captain, you know, I, whereas I think Fuff, like playing a straight drive or working, or, or working out a, a deficiency against spin bowling, I think Fuff saw leadership and captaincy as, as a craft that he had to work on, as well as, as, well as a natural skill that he had. And, and I, think, I think that can only come from someone who, who, who is naturally empathetic to, to the struggles of others. I'm not getting to this person in the way that, that I would like. My message is not being received by this bowler, by my, my understudy, by my, my coach above me. How else can I do it? In the same way that one might figure out how to face a short ball or, or, or how to bowl to a batsman who's, who's really good on his pads, something like that. So, yeah, I, I, think, I think empathy is, a, is definitely a word that circles the, the Fuff Duplicy narrative, yeah. And, and you briefly touched on, oh, you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times, the A.B. De Villiers thing. So it mm. felt like to me as a writer reading your article that you were mm. really trying to prove into the subconscious of, of Faf when it came. I mean, I, I was, I'm just trying to think about, it's an incredible situation that they have because A.B. De Villiers is unlike kind of anyone else in cricket. And, you know, you know I, I wrote a piece recently about how I think he could play until he was 45 if the various yeah. joints in his body sort of stand up because he sees the ball so much earlier than everyone else. Mm. And we also know that he probably, unlike most cricketers, I think he definitely could have been a professional in one or two other, you know, he's one of those proper, you know, LeBron James, Roger Federer type athletes where you could have just dropped him in a different sport and, you know, he would have been fine. And so with that, what must it have been like to be a very talented cricketer? And even as you said, at times be promoted ahead of him, but know that this is the special talent um, of a generation coming through beside you. I, I don't think for Faf, the thing is that when you ask someone like Faf that that's his reality. He doesn't like, he doesn't have another, another upbringing of that. All he knows is what it is like to, he must've almost from a very young age, always known what it's like to be the second best player in the world. Actually, mm -hmm. I'm going to go an even better story that I heard recently. One of the guys from the Cool Runnings, right? Hmm. He told me when he was a kid, he wanted to be a sprinter. And he went out on the beach with his brother. His brother was like two years younger than him. And, and his brother just went, Phew! and he's like, God, well, I'm obviously slow. Look how quick this guy is. And it turned out his brother would end up being the seventh quickest man in the world in like 1985, <laughs> right? right? And, right. you know, and this guy was obviously went on to be, uh, uh, you know, an incredible athlete himself in the, in the Cool Runnings bobsled. That, that kind of thing, it's like a completely different reality from what most of us have to deal with. Most, you know, most people who make it to the top level are the best already. And he had someone better than him right beside him. I, I find that so fascinating. Well, I think in a way it, it maybe helped him. You know, like you said, so many guys leave school, go to their franchise or their province and then get to the national team. And it's only really at that stage do they, do they confront people who are better than them. And you, you know, you... How often do you see guys dominate in, in, in the county and state cricket and provincial cricket and they come up against someone who's worked them out and they just get the yips and they, and they struggle? I think Faf learned a, a, an important lesson early on. He had so much... In, in any other school in the country in that year, Faf Duplessis would have been the biggest product to come out of, mm. of, of his school. But because he was next to the all-time great, certainly the, the, the best cricketer that I've ever seen and, and the way you write about him, I think you... you we may hold similar views with that, or at least similar, if not the same. So I think he learned some, I think he learned a valuable lesson and, and it was hard to probe with it. So, so you say as a writer, you were thinking, okay, how do I probe that? I, I, in the agreed upon, the pre-agreed uh, set of questions, I got back a, back a screenshot from the South African press officer with, with all my questions written out. There were about 20 or 30 of them. And there were two big black lines. And the, those two black, big black lines were crossing out my questions directly relating to A.B. de Villiers. So, so Fuff didn't want to talk about it. He, 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 he had said to me at the, well, through his, through the press officer that he's spoken about it. So much has been written about it. He wants to tell his side of his story without Abe and Avilius. And I didn't even, and I was like, okay, fine. I'm not going to bring it up. If, if it got to like the last five minutes and we hadn't touched on it, I probably would have tried to shoehorn it in, but it wasn't long before, before Fuff brought Abe up himself and, you know, those quotes about the comparison, about how Faf never considered himself to be a great player, but a good player, and, and how he was always compared with AB, he brought that up himself. So it, it is always at the back of his mind. I mean, how could it not be, right? I mean, mm. you, you know, if, if, if you were coming through with, I don't know, the, the greatest cricket writer, fill in the blank, whoever that is, the greatest commentator, there would always be a bit of part of you that was like, mm, and, and if that guy was the best man at your wedding, do you know what I mean? So yeah. the, the, the specter of, of AB de Villiers 
you know, it could have been a a ballast to to Faf, but it generally wasn't. And 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 just for that, I I, I, th I think he 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 is worth praising because I think it takes a, a real inner strength to 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 look at someone like that and, and not be jealous and, and and not be down on yourself and 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 get comfortable with the with the dirty side road that you're going to have to take. So yeah, I, I really I really do commend him for that. Yeah, I, it's interesting that he he's already trying to control the narrative in that way because mm. it's impossible. Like I'm trying to think of another, you know, because they are school friends and it's come all the way up and you know similar age and you know similar jobs, even you know middle order guys. It's just yeah. like there's no getting away from that. Now, one thing I really want to focus on, and and I don't know the best way to answer this, but. I looked at his record. So I think he averaged 28 uh, with the bat in first class cricket for Lancashire when, when he played for them. Uh, there's the, a number of times he's played as an overseas player in a, what, what we, you would call a B um, league. So not the IPL essentially, or not the PSL and struggled again. Uh, mm. You write about how he struggled when he played club cricket as well. Mm. And yet he's gone on to build a great career at international level and in the IPL, which are the two highest forms of the game that we've got. Is that just because perhaps he was a late developer and a late bloomer? Um, or is it just, is there something else I'm missing? It's such a tough question. You know, m maybe he he's more switched on, you know, in South African rugby circles, there's a line that, that, that you know, you, you put a Springbok jersey on player X and he becomes a different player. You know, you know, he might he might be rubbish for the Stormers or the Sharks, but he's but he puts the green and gold of the Springboks on. Now he's running through walls. Maybe there's something to that. Maybe he he raised his standard. I, I'm not sure. I mean, his his fielding has always been immense, so yeah. he's he's sort of worth having, even if he's not scoring a lot of runs. Um, I, I I don't know. It's 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 a it's a good question, and and you know, not not to you know, every piece can be better. I was talking to my wife today about why I hate the I hate the term. I hate it when people brag about being perfectionists because. As if, as if there is a something like perfect and what probably the thing that makes my piece not perfect, not that it's anywhere near it, but the thing that I could have definitely done better is, is go deeper into, into those struggles. And, and it's something that I, that I was conscious of because I would have loved to have asked him that. And the truth is, I don't know. Um, I did get a message from someone involved in Lancashire. I, I'm not sure if I should say he's now a, a Sky Sports commentator. Maybe I'll just leave it at that and, and keep it mysterious. Um, was it Matt? Who was? <laughs> no, well, no. <laughs> uh, who was very? He was upset with the way that I'd written the piece because he feels that I didn't go deep enough into the way that the way he sees it, how Fuff used Lancashire as a stepping stone, despite assurances that he wouldn't be doing so, that he would be that he was in it for the long haul, that he wouldn't be. Taking the cold pack, are you smiling because you know who I might be talking about? It, it, not so much I know who you're talking about, although I'm pretty sure I do know who you're talking about. But um, it's more that, like, like she had this really weird relationship with her overseas players. Like, mm. I don't know if you ever know about the Marcus North one as well, where they were like, yeah. oh, we're never going to get a player as average as Marcus North again. And Faf <laughs> had a very average record for them as well. And it's like, yeah. I think sometimes they don't realise that they have picked players who are not quite ready at that level. And Faf was... It, as I've just said, he struggled in, in, in club cricket around that time. He struggled mm -hmm. um, uh, when he played in, in, in other levels of cricket even after that. He was not anywhere near the, the finished um, uh, 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 piece. So any cricket that he played then would be a stepping stone for him. Like he just wasn't a, an obvious international player at that point. And, and like we're going we're gonna to scold a, a 21, 22-year-old who's finally got a South African call-up when his best mate has been scoring hundreds of, of 80 balls in World Cups. And now he's offered the chance to be involved, in that, and we're gonna we're gonna chastise the guy for 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 leaping at that opportunity, you know. I, like and like I said to our, our our friend at Sky Sports, I said, you know, I, if if I was you, if it was me, I'd be cutting him a bit of slack, you know. Look, let let's get some perspective on on why he may have treated Lancashire as a stepping stone. Yeah, I, mean, I I understand that in Lancashire and Yorkshire they they see their their county sides as international sides, really, don't they? Like mm -hmm. they see it in a different way than you know some other first class um, um, setups would. And so I understand that 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 side of it. But realistically, it's like it, one of the first things I did when I worked you know with T Twenty teams is like saying to everyone, the best thing we can do now is find out why everyone is in this room, because. Mm -hmm. 
there are people here who want to play for the West Indies. There are people here who want to get in the IPL. There are people here who, you know, want to get jobs as commentators. In you. Do you know what I mean? You're much mm. better off finding out that. And, and like, and, but it's very hard to be honest if, uh, if you're the only one being asked that. And he, he was asked the question. And of course he said he probably wanted to play for Lancashire as much as possible. But yeah, exactly. The other thing is, I think it was, was it Mike Watkinson you quoted in the piece yes. about him being limited? I want to talk about this because. I see myself as an, uh, one of the world's experts in how limited FAF is, right? Hmm. Because um, uh, I spent a lot of time looking him up um, as, as an, doing analysis for TalkSport. And it's incredible how limited his game is, even while he was still making runs. Now, there is a certain point, I've just done a video on, on, on BJ Watling, and there's a certain hmm. point where every international cricketer is limited. Right, it's impossible not to have limitations. You know, there's 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 A B de Villiers, and there's kind of everyone else. You know, in, in that sort of thing. But he basically has this huge weakness for the ball, just outside, off stump, um, uh, on a good length. And Mike Watkinson mentions this. And when did he play for Lancashire? Two thousand eight, two thousand and nine. Yeah, yeah, around then. And he's mentioning it. Yeah. yeah, and he's mentioning it from that period. And I'm in South Africa in 2019, 2020, and I'm still seeing that same weakness. That shows the incredible sort of mental fortitude that he has because he is a very limited player. You bowl on his stumps and he's as good as anyone in the world, in world cricket. You just shift that line half a foot outside off stump and he's a terribly average cricketer. And so to have the career he's had, I think shows a lot about his, his brain and the way he thinks about things. 100%. You know, as you're speaking now, I'm picturing, okay, well, what does a Faf Duplessis, Duplessis shot look like? You know, what, 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 what is the quintessential shot? Does he, does he cut well? Not really. He's pretty good on the back foot through the covers. He's good off his hips. Like you say, he pulls well, he's, he's, you know, because of that big wide grip he's got. Mm-hmm. So, you, so you, you can kind of shovel anything that's slightly short. But you're right, I, I can't picture him cover driving. And for a South African cricketer, certainly one who's, who's batting in the top four or five, that's astounding to me mm. because apart from our nuggety left-handers, yeah. uh, Smith, Elga, Kirsten, they all, they, all come, they all drive through the covers like a dream. It's very you know, rare they, for a right-hander who comes from Australia or, or any Western place, realistically, not to be able to cover drive because it's a yeah. fairly natural shot, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, because well, I mean, that, that's the lines and lengths of people are bowling, yeah. you know, they want to get it up there. He's, 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 he's good off the short board. And is it mental fortitude? Well, maybe, you know, it's, 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 it's such an unquantifiable thing that, that keeps uh, journalists like myself and, and, and you and, and Tim Wigmore in the game where we keep trying to quantify the unquantifiable. Um, yeah, I, I, again, it'd be, it'd be great to speak to him about it. You know, how did you manage to put that away? Because, yeah, he nicked off, but I don't think he, he necessarily nicked off a lot more than anyone else. You know, he, he wasn't getting bold more. Than, than someone like maybe JP Dumini who, who just could eventually couldn't play a straight one. So mm. yeah, it's, it's got to be that mental toughness, right? It's got, it's got to come from a position where I'm not going here. I, I, I'm just not leaving this crease. And, you know, I think it also helps, you know, like I said in the piece, it's, it's hard to, it's hard to build a, a narrative around someone's character on the way that they played one particular mm. innings. But I, I, I do think it's so integral to the, to telling the story of Fluff Duplicy that, that debut knock, um, uh, where was it? It was in Adelaide, was it? Adelaide, yeah. A- against Australia, where we came up and saved the game, and 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 South Africa went on to win the series. It, 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 it's too neat, you know. It's almost like a Disney film, but I really think it does fit in this in this way. That really typifies what the guy was all about. Well, the interesting thing is, two of his most famous innings are, you know, or you know, final innings, um, you know, knocks and 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 everything. But so I checked this because you know I would always do this. He averaged 27 in, in the fourth innings, which is uh, top six batsman in test cricket during his career, averaged 30, right? Wow. So he's actually, hmm. for, for an above average player, that's a very, very low mark considering we remember him as that. So that's kind of what I, what I mean is that mm. uh, most players know their weakness one way or another. Like that's what you're trying to do. Um, in fact, you, you got me in touch with Dr. What's her name? Cheryl, uh, uh, Cherie Caldwell? Sh- Cheryl Calder. Yeah. Cold, yeah, I got that wrong in every different way, but I was so close. <laughs> yeah. um, and she was saying to me that the first thing she learned working with professional athletes is how they hide their weaknesses. And they don't even, sometimes they don't even know. It's just a natural thing of, you mm. know, whatever you're not good at, you find a way of, of, of nullifying. But in his case, it's like, 
th- those not being able to play a length ball outside off stump and also <laughs> struggling in the fourth innings and yet building the career that he ended up building and um, and playing the innings that he ended up playing they don't it doesn't actually make sense they don't they don't quite correlate which mm. shows to me that there is there is something else. And the other one that I remember, and I think Neil Manthorpe told, told me this, and I don't know if you've ever um, um, heard about it or written about it, but there was a period, I think not long after he became a captain, where he went to all the groundsmen and said, make, make the pitches really spicy because uh, this is going to help us. And then he went back to the batters and he said, look, we're going to get hit a lot and we're going to mm. break our fingers and we're going to be hitting the chest and we're going to be hitting the head, but we're going to be used to it. And so we will win more tests and everyone else will struggle. Like little things like that. Again, that's, I think that's almost looking at his batting and going, do you know what's our strength? Our strength may not be talent at the moment, but it might be that we have a bunch of tough guys who are used to these kind of pitches. How do we win with that? And that, that story is sort of how he built his career for me. Mm. I think, I think, Going to a team like that and saying, we're going to get hit a lot, we might go out, but we've got the bowling attack to do that. Going to his batters, I, I wonder how a guy like Graham Smith would have done that. And I contrasted with, with Fuff. I think Fuff is also more, ex- I think you have to be a captain who is accepting of failure and ineptitude in a certain way. I think if, if, if Smith did that, you would have seen a lot of rotation among the top six if he was captaining this, this, this side that Fuff captained. You know, when you got, when you got Hashimamla, Amy de Villiers, Graham Smith himself, uh, Jacques Cullis, you know, you can pick, prepare whatever pitch you want. They're probably going to be okay. But if you've got the, the top order that, that Fuff had and you, and you in giving those instructions to the groundsman, the fact that he was able to retain some sort of consistency mm. and the fact that his team did struggle while doing so, I think really speaks to how he was accepting of people's shortcomings. And, you know, just, just on Fuff, on Fuff's numbers, I was quite surprised when I started doing the numbers because in my mind, Buff is a much better cricketer than, than, the, than the numbers show. And I, I think I, I think in my attempt to, to uh, deviate from the hagiography that this had, had developed into, um, I try to say that, that the numbers don't quite tell the story because if you just look at the face of it, he's not really going to go down as a, as a South African great, is he? he he's, you know, to steal a, a cliche from, from, from football, he was more a, a, a player of great innings than a great batsman. Um, but again, I, 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 I'm fine with that. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Like, I, I have no problems and I, they are black and white saying that Faf Duplessis deserves his place in the pantheon, another cliche, of South African greats. Um, yes, for the runs, but, but, so, but for so much else and for what he is and for what he embodies and, you know, for those little things like that of saying to his team of frankly limited batsmen, guys, good luck. We're going to go play on, on, on the toughest wickets in the world. But I back you because I'm right there with you with my limitations. Did the ball tampering thing affect him in South Africa at all? No, not in South Africa. <laughs> is the is the, is the short answer easy? Uh, yeah, we can we can be a bit you know my country right or wrong, especially especially with our sports. Um, some people are like that with our, with our uh, political parties as well. But when it comes to our sports teams, you know, Skulk Berger can can gouge someone's eye out in a rugby field. Hansi Crenier can commit the worst. I mean, you know, pe- people, still defend, people still defend <laughs> Hansi Crenier. It's, it's, yeah. Yep. So, so, if, and also, you know, if, uh, I don't know if that's because people put up, you know, just like shrug their shoulders at the, at the, at the crime against humanity that apartheid was. So it's like, ah, uh, you know, it's mint sweets on a cricket field. That's not so bad. And also if we're comparing us to what Hansi did and we let him off the hook, well, you know, a zipper, it's not so bad. Also that it was against the Aussies, the second one that is not, not the zipper. Um, it's like, well, you know, whatever we do to the Aussies is, is fair game because they're a bunch of bullies and who cares what we do to them. Uh, also, that incident at the airport where a security guard pushed a Nia network reporter, I believe it was. Um, so, no. So, we, we, we certainly circled the wagons around and, and, and we weren't bothered by it at all. I think that considering what happened to the Australians, he's done very well to be so untarnished globally by it. But I think mm. partly it's because people do respect, you know, uh, Steve Smith was the best player in the world. And David Warner was, you know, one of the best two openers in the world for most of his mm. career. And they were mm-hmm. still cheating. Um, there's a big difference, I think, between that and, and, and what Faf did. Even if you and I know there is no difference, like 
They, you know, the only difference was the, the actual implements at the end of the day and whether yeah. something was brought on the ground specifically to do it. Right. Um, so there's a, there's a, diff- a level there, but he was also caught doing it twice. Uh, yeah. And he was caught doing it twice. Also, Vernon Philander was caught doing it during his reign as well. So mm-hmm. I, I, I just find it really interesting. And I think, it, I think a lot goes back to that he's always been a fairly a humble person. And I think that I think the cricket fans kind of almost respect his his game, like the way he's gone about it. One mm. of the really fascinating stories that I'd kind of forgotten was that in the, probably the very close to one of the only times that South Africa has actually choked in a World Cup. Uh, he was at the crease in that game against New Zealand where they did yes. actually look like they lost the plot a little bit. Mm. I didn't realise that he got death threats for the run out of AB de Villiers and everything. Uh, you know, I think if that was another cricketer, that would be part of their like public narrative a lot more, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. And he just sort of takes it on his impressive frame and, and gets on with it. It's, it's such a good point you make because I wasn't aware of it either. And it was interesting, you know, you see, you see your article, you know, all cricket monthly articles or all big articles that, that do relatively well. You see them c- circulated around and people pick quotes from here and there. And it was interesting among all the, all the lines that he'd given me, the death threat line was the one that sort of got the most airtime you know when i when i went on when i was scrolling through twitter you know i would see so many publications running with the i received death threats or my wife received death threats and and that was the 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 gist of the piece that that they were kind of rehashing and and it's it's so interesting what you say now because if it was if it was anyone else it's like i would have heard about that that would have been something that they maybe would have come out and said or or, or maybe it was a different age And, and you say he absorbs it and and I, I think that is the stereotype alpha male South African in him. Yep. That he didn't make a bigger deal of it. And, I, you know, he can, he can handle it how he wants to handle it. But I think it was the fact that he said, okay, fine, I'm going to wear this on my chisel chest. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to take it. it. It did make him mistrustful. You know, Fuck Duplessis notoriously did not give exclusives. In fact, the, one of the ways that I managed to convince them uh, to, to allow me this one is because Dan Bredick had just run three exclusives uh, with Australians. And I was like, guys, we can't, we can't let the Aussies have, have all these exclusives. We, 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 we got to get a South African on this, on, on this list. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is interesting. And on, on why he didn't get a lot of stick for the, for the ball tampering stuff. I think it is because of the way he gives press conferences, which is also why maybe people didn't chase him for exclusives. You've seen him in a presser, you know, when you ask him a question, he answers it Yeah. and he looks you in the eye. And if he knows your name, he'll, he'll say, well, Jared, blah, 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 blah. You know, don't don't all journalists love it when the players know our name? You know, we all we all we all get so giddy that we're part of the inner circle. On the opposite, we're not... I'm terrified when they know my name. I prefer uh, oh, none of them know who I am. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, you know, if, if we feel like we're part, like we could be buddies in another, yeah. or I could be, a, or I could be. He'll tap me on the know... shoulder one day in the bar, and we'll have a beer together. Yeah, or, or I could, or I could bat at six for the side. You know, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I think I think he just gets good press. People just write great things about him. All, all the South African journals. He got a bit of the one thing he did get stick for, where he com- was his comments about uh, "I don't see color" in light yeah, of Temba Vuba being dropped. And I, I, I imagine that you were going to uh, raise it at some point. He did get stick for that, and I still don't think he. I, I think he copped out of, of his culpability in that, but you know, he, he owned he owned his mistake and he put his hand up. But I still think it was a mistake he shouldn't have made. Yeah, it was, it's a very interesting one, and I think there's there's been a lot of pressure over the last two years now uh, to to believe that these athletes should be um, you know cognizant of what is happening around them in the world and all mm-hmm. these sorts of things. I've seen I saw South African players, non-white South African players, tweeting with the hashtag "All Lives Matter," and you realise that they right. don't always know exactly why they are tweeting things and. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, you look back to that Rebel tour when the West Indians went to South Africa, and you know the the, the incredible book um, by Ashley Gray on that, and he yes. he was saying they a lot of them just didn't really know. They knew South Africa was bad for black people, but they didn't mm. really know what that meant. They just knew that they were being offered jobs, and I, I would have thought that Flaff should have known. He's travelled the world a little bit more. He's a little bit more worldly. But I also know that a lot of cricketers that you and I love watching have horrendous political ideas. 
um, and don't understand politics a lot, even though they have very stringent <laughs> political ideas. Mm. Uh, and, and you know, we, we have to accept that they are going to stuff up. And that was, I think that was a very tone deaf thing to say in South African cricket at that time. Again, he probably got away with it because it was before the Black Lives Matter movement was a big deal. I don't know if he would have said that after Black Lives Matter. He just about made the deadline, didn't he? I think it was yeah. like two or three weeks before it, 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 it really took off. But transformation had been an issue yeah. for, for a long time. You can't play cricket in South Africa and not know something about that, that issue. So while, while I commend him for holding his hand up, and like you said, he, he, he meant it in the best possible way. And Temba Bavuma has told me himself that I want to be seen as a cricketer first and a black person second. And I said, well, you know, Temba, I don't know how to break this to you, but that's never going to happen unfortunately. And, and, and I, I just think five should have known better, but again, you know, I'm, 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 I'm really nitpicking here and, and trying to show he's a rounded character who, who is capable of mistakes, but, but he immediately, he immediately came out and said, you know, all lives don't matter until in capitals, black lives matter. Um, he, he was the first, he was the most high profile active white player to, to stand behind Lungi and Gidi when, when he, when he made his comments. So, you know, he made a mistake, but he copped to it. But I, I, I do, do with what I think he, he shouldn't have made it. But again, I'm, I'm perhaps being a bit harsh there. Just on him, uh, there's a line in your piece where he says, "I never considered myself a great player, but I knew I was a good player." You, you put him in the pantheon of greats, but I think that you are probably looking at his impact on South African yes. team, maybe his impact on South African culture at times. Um, mm. You know, uh, uh, you're probably factoring in his fielding um, and 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 the one day cricket. Where do you think cricket will remember him in in five to ten years? Well, as as an ODI cricketer, I think I think he is a bona fide modern great. I, I, I think I think his numbers do support that. Um, he 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 very often led the batting in in, in limited overs cricket. Like he was South Africa's premier batter. He, even well, I was going to say even with a bit of it is, but I don't stand by that. Um, he was even better than the best limited overs batter. Yeah, ever. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. So I, I think I think with the white ball, he he should be considered a great. Um, with the red ball, it's his captaincy, it's his fielding, it's it's the side he inherited, it's it's how he he changed the way we think of of what leadership is. It's the way he just kept beating Australia. I think that, I think that's got to count for something. The fact that he was the first South African captain to win a series, both home and away. That has to count for something. Um, yeah, I, 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 I put him there. I, though, it, when I was doing this, I was like, okay, well, Dan, let's see if you stand by that. And why don't you compile a, a great, a South African great 11 since readmission? And he, he didn't make it. And, and I don't even think he made my white ball side. So even even though I, I, I sounds like I'm contradicting myself, um, if he wasn't captain, if it wasn't for all these little caveats, he he would be considered. I would agree with him. He he'd be considered a good player, but not a great player. But he was a great cricketer, and he was a great cricket man, mm. and and he was great for South African cricket. And I, I I feel sorry for him in a way that that he's left the team through no fault of his own. He's he's leaving a team in a worse state than 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 one he inherited. And I I think that we might you know whenever we look at presidents. We always think of okay. Well, what was the impact of of Obama? Well, what, what did he leave the, the the next president? You know, like did what did he did he receive a hospital pass? Did he give a hospital pass? So, I, I wonder if we, if in however many years time we look back on Fuff's legacy and we think, well, but what did he leave behind? He didn't he, apart from a couple of serious wins, which themselves have their caveats. He didn't he, he didn't deliver a trophy. He he didn't carry a side to greatness. He under his wing. All-time greats, apart from maybe Chisa Rabada, didn't develop. You know, Aidan Markham's career hasn't gone the way we wanted it to go. Quinton de Kock's career has, has in a way, plateaued. Um, so it'll be interesting. And, and I, I do feel sorry for him. I hope, because I've committed 5,000 words to him, that people remember him as, as, as a great, because in my mind, he is. Thanks for coming on the podcast. No, thank you. It was a pleasure.